Welcome to our second to last lecture. I know whoever is, has not yet turned in their paper, if you could just wait till the end of class to turn in your paper and take your 25 point deduction. Um, so, uh, all right, so we'll just wait till you all sit down and settle down. I wish we had a, okay. Michael, could I, could I ask you to do something? You know, we may have, maybe we should do the evals today. Maybe. Depends how, you know, if we have time. But could you go to my box and bring those with, but only if we have time. Okay. Okay, you guys, welcome to, to the lecture. Hopefully you all found your study guide. And that will considerably, you know, focus your efforts at mastering all of this material. One of the questions I even gave you outright. That's the good side, except the bad thing is, I think it might be a really hard question. But I will be in my office um, today uh, from 2 to also, I can stay a little late if someone needs to come after 3, let me know after class. Um, uh, Thursday, I actually have to leave at 3, but I plan to come to campus on Monday for a few hours so that we can have some additional office hours the week of the final. That being said, let's get to the matter at hand, which uh, deals with magic in modernity, the return of the repressed. So why am I calling it the return of the repressed? Well, so many efforts have been actively made through this process of modernization, which really begins in earnest around 1600, the early modern period, Active efforts have been made to trample on magical thinking, to expel it, not just from the sciences, the emerging sciences, but also from religion. All right, I'm going to wait just till everybody settles down because it's so active. Okay, starting the lecture again. Uh, all right, so if we remember in the early modern period, even the Catholic Church found to its dismay that it was being accused of being a magical institution. What were these ideas that the Catholic Church was magical? Where did they come from? Well, when we started having that reformist critique, intellectuals, not necessarily exclusively trained by the church and under the church control, but intellectuals started reading the uh, New Testament in the original Greek, started applying sort of critical skills, critical thinking to their evaluation of the Catholic program, and they began to see there was all sorts of accretions in there that simply did not jibe with the Bible, and therefore were present through no really decent rationale, i.e., they're rational. There's no real program in the Bible to necessarily um, a guarantee seven, seven of the sacraments. Most of the Protestant faiths scaled back to two. So you had this notion that the Catholic Church itself was under siege for this critique of magic. And what did we see at that same period as the Catholic Church tried to purge itself of some of the practices that might have been perceived as, oh, even satanic? We saw this hysterical outbreak of witchcraft accusations. Essentially people going, I'm not satanic, no, you're satanic. I'm not magical, no, you're magical. So all the, in a way that was kind of unique, people began to consider magical practices within the framework of religion, within the framework even of these new emerging natural philosophies as something undesirable, rogue, um, renegade, unauthorized, even in the extreme case of witchcraft, as satanic. We know there was something about Protestantism specifically that it had a very chaste notion of how you interacted with God, a very chaste notion about how we would perceive this natural universe. And when I say that, I mean, Norton is so snorry and loud, stop that. Um, he, I hope you can, I'm, that's hurting my feelings. Um, okay, so, 
a sort of chaste theology where if there's any magic in the universe, if there's any sort of breaking or violating of the, na of the natural laws, it's not going to be done some, by some priest on whose authority. A priest isn't a shaman, isn't a, a warlock. We, don't, uh, we are not m believers in magic. We are religious people. We believe in miracles. Ergo, if you want some supernatural event, the only person that you can turn to to affect that in your universe is God. So Protestantism, one of its critiques and one of the reasons why it so radically pairs down the sacraments, one of the sacraments it pairs down was the sacrament of ordination by which a priest becomes a sort of mystically endowed being through this sacramental um, chrisming of, of him. He's sort of endowed with a kind of divine aspect and has a special relationship with God. Part of Protestant impulse to democratize religion was to get rid of the priests. So in so many ways, Protestant theology is an enemy of magic. And even to this day, um, if you are going to see protests against Disney World and protests against Harry Potter, they tend to be focused in um, more fundamentalist uh, branches of pr the Protestant church. So all magic in the world is now focused in God, the God's capacity. And of course, if God is the one conducting the supernatural event, the supernatural intercession, it's not magic now, is it? It is miraculous. So over the course of the 1600s, there's a purging of a kind of magical consciousness in rega with regard to religion and a more of a, a miraculous understanding where magic is going to be something it is the, the sort of thunderbolt of God. It's not something we can manipulate ourselves. And this became very important in terms of Catholic uh, legitimacy to keep up with the Protestants who are making all of these sort of rational reductions to their faith. The Catholics also in the Counter-Reformation had to do the same thing, although they managed to hold on to many of their sacraments. A lot of that other stuff, the sort of magical consciousness that had crept in through their you know, hundreds of years of interacting with peasant witchcraft and peasant agrarian cult practices and beliefs had sort of infiltrated the Catholic Church. So that gets pushed out, gets pushed out of religion. It is no longer going to have a safe institutional home, very uh, self-conscious. Religions today, institutional religions, are very self-conscious about that kind of accusation. We already know that it is inconsistent with science, right? From the get-go, when we had the pre-Socratic philosophers, they looked at the magi right, those foreign priests from the, from the East, and they looked at them with suspicion. And magi, the source word for magician, was considered a pejorative term that uh, in, indicated this guy is a swindler, he's a charlatan, he's a trickster, he's full of hocus pocus, whereas we, the Greek philosophers, are full of the illumination of reason and order and understanding so that we can explain to you why things happen, not turn our backs, wave our hands, make a few incantations, and voila, right? So the nature of the, the sort of Western reception of magic from the very beginning, in a way, has tainted magic as something really foreign, really suspect. So we have religion dubbing magic as diabolical, the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation demonizing these practices of the occult. Remember, the invention of witchcraft is literally taking um, all of this sort of residue material, these residue beliefs of people in these older uh, agrarian sediment, which is still sort of hanging there in the medium of peasant culture, and reinterpreting it within this new theological framework of early modern uh, Christianity and saying, oh, I know what that is. That's the devil. That's the devil-worshipping diabolism of witchcraft. Okay, science has another take on magic. Science looks at magic as backsliding ignorance. We know that these emergent philosophers in the 1600s and the 1700s uh, with Galileo, he's very critical of the church. 
He wants to make sure that the church keeps their hands out of religion. And on some level, there's a sense with these new natural philosophers that they have to keep the supernatural out of the realm of the natural, or they're going to literally lose their authority over nature. In that expression of Galileo's, he was actually quoting another uh, church authority, so it should have been a safe thing to say, but he wanted to know not how to go to heaven, but how the heavens go. And if you divide those things equally, well, not necessarily equally, but if, if you divide those things into two separate realms of investigation, there shouldn't be necessarily a conflict within, between science and religion. And you see that science feels very vulnerable about controlling natural explanations, naturalistic explanations. Now, what if you let ma magical thinking into science? That means science is going to be, be able to account for the sort of natural laws of causality. But if there are these rogue, magical impulses in nature, then science has to share its authority. So in ways, science has a vested interest in keeping both magic and religion out of its sphere of authority. We know that when we talked about the 1500s and the 1600s, what was so interesting was how many hermetical philosophers, all the way up until Isaac Newton, are actually reformulating notions of the cosmos using these rebellious, renegade ideas. They, they're inspired by Plato and the Corpus Hermeticum, using those renegade ideas as a way of throwing out Aristotle. But after 1700, we hear less and less and less of hermetic philosophy, and we hear more and more of a strident tone of materialism. Think about those Enlightenment texts I gave you, um, De, De La Maitre and De Holbach. They were trying to explain to you that all causes are transparently material and physical. This is not some mysterious world of magical correspondences. This is a world of mechanical, reductive cause and effects where the mathematicians are going to be the one who have predictive power and authority. The mathematicians and the rationalists are going to be the ones that are going to tell you what's going to happen, what's going to be the outcome of this material system. And are, they're going to be the ones that can manipulate this material system. They're going to be the new magicians because they're going to be the new people in charge of technology. So there's going to be a kind of power that science steals from magic because its framework of understanding the world is so powerful, it's actually able to eventually produce things like a remote control. So through this act of conceding that the world is material and subject to material explanation, through the efforts of surrendering um, ambitions to know God or tell the future or you know, uh, take mysterious power unto themselves, science has created a tremendous amount of authority that was normally held by the shaman. If you used to want to make sure that you were fertile, you would go to the shaman and have him pray for you. If you wanted to make sure you had a boy, you would go to the shaman and make sure that he'd pray for you, uh, create some sort of special um, formula. There'd probably be a, a verbal formula. There'd be a collection of herbs he would get. He would assemble from his basket of knowledge and his mystical understanding of how your womb and your fertility correlate through this magical interconnection of herbs and potions and incantations, he would cure you or make you pregnant, make sure you had a, a boy or a girl. Now, where do you go if you want to pull that off? Apparently, you would go to a fertility clinic, and you would have a scientist who is interpreting your reproductivity totally in a scientific framework and doing what? Creating incredibly effective results. So same objective, get the person pregnant, uh, and you can even select your sex, and now science is encroaching in ways that are so incredibly effective that, let's face it, a person in the 1600s who had this kind of magical thinking would have his wildest expectations fulfilled, right? 
Scientists are doing things way beyond the mystical dimension. Okay, so that was sort of an explanation of why magic shouldn't be so powerful today. We know science has sort of railroaded efficacy in this world. Being effective in this world, you are far better off in many ways going with a scientific route, and religion has sort of taken over being effective in the next world. So religion is sort of the, uh, the steward of our souls. Science is the steward of our bodies. They've retreated to their separate spheres, and yet magic remains so powerful. And so we've got to ask ourselves why, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Quantum mysticism, we've already touched on this issue, that just the very nature of quantum consciousness itself is a description of magical thinking. What are the things that we learned from the Copenhagen interpretation of matter? Well, when an electron decides to become a particle, it is essentially doing so because you observed it. So somehow, your observation participated in the system of energy and caused it to collapse into a particle. The Copenhagen interpretation also tells us that this weird electron knows that you're watching it. It knows that if there's a detector on the slit it's going through, it's in some ways expected to act like a particle. If there isn't a detector there, it's expected to act like a wave. And it literally modifies its behavior to act this way. So we have ourselves now, if you very loosely interpret this, magically participating in the world because our observation collapses the wave into the particle. We have the particle itself acting very magical because this is a sort of sentient matter that knows what's expected of it. We also have this notion that relativity indicates that space and time are just fictions of consciousness, that they're all a matter of your perspective. Wow, a whole lot is hanging on you and your precious point of view. This is a major role for subjectivity in the 20th century interpretation of reality. And then another feature of the Copenhagen interpretation, non-locality, that weird, magical assumption par excellence that something here could somehow impact something 11 kilometers away. Remember those particles that were sent hurling in opposite directions 11 uh, kilometers apart? That one particle here can somehow magically, we don't really know how, we call it quantum entanglement, but somehow it can, the effects that it undergoes in this local region will impact an entangled particle 11 kilometers away. We don't know why it happens, but think about it. That's a weird correspondence between these two particles, right? It's a correlation. It's a way that they're causally connected. It's an impact that the two of them have on each other. That's not about this kind of impact. That's not about the impact we can explain in any of the kind of forces we actually understand. So what's doing it? We just don't know. Science has really left a huge amount of occult mystery at the level of the quantum universe. And then take all of this information and extrapolate it. You start getting the idea that the universe is acting a lot more like a mind than a thing. The universe is a sort of extraordinary structure of information, information that structures energy and manifests the, the patterns of um, elemental particles out of this energy. And it is not possible to be materialistic, to find causes and effects that science can simply explain and simply understand, and that you can simply understand. And if science can't explain it, and science can't fully own it, the rash of speculators rush in. Now, I mentioned these two books, The Tao of Physics and The Dancing Wooly Masters, that they came out in the 1970s. 
One of them is by a physicist. The Tao of Physics, uh, for Chuff Capra, was actually a physicist. The Dancing Wooly Masters, um, Gary Zukov, I just think he had, I think, um, an undergraduate degree in physics. So it's not like these two were major, major authorities, but at the same time, educated people who understood the science and understood something else, that there's a weird convergence between this science and Eastern mysticism. So already, we're introducing one idea to this sort of explanation of why we have magical consciousness in modernity. And one of the ideas is that simply quantum explanation, unfortunately or unfortunately, lends itself to this kind of appropriation. And there's other things about it that you might have picked up on as well. There's this enlarged role, this enlarged role of the individual's subjectivity. In a way, that's a very threatening idea. You mean we don't live in an objective universe? You mean there is no single truth? It's also a really empowering idea. You mean I have a huge role in constituting reality? And in a way, modernity is a very unique time historically, unprecedented in the sort of engorgement of the significance of the individual. Not an individual, like a really powerful pharaoh or a really powerful king, but the notion of the individual as a universalized concept, what it means to be this individual, is unprecedented in its scope and volume in modernity. And when you have this role of quantum consciousness emphasizing your subjective participation in the universe, isn't it almost a continuation sits comfortably with that pronounced significance of the individual? Even if I were to tie two seemingly unrelated things together, if I were to take even the idea that Descartes and put forward, he said, distrust tradition, distrust uh, Distrust tradition, distrust the Bible, even distrust your senses. You must anchor your certainty on one simple idea, I think, therefore, I am. So he, in this groundbreaking statement of modern epistemology, actually kind of said something that oddly anticipates quantum physics. I think, therefore, I am. Reality is rooted in my mind. Remember, he denigrated the idea of the senses being trustworthy, but he didn't deny the primacy of the rational mind in determining what was real. Even though Locke knocks that down, Locke upholds one important aspect of this modern revolution in selfhood. Locke still says, who's the ultimate authority? in determining something, whether it's true or not true, you are. You're the ultimate authority. Now, you're going to need to get educated. You're going to need to be disciplined. You're going to need to trust your senses. You're going to need to trust your reason and your method. But you are the ultimate authority. Locke, too, was radically skeptical throughout tradition. And he threw out, he threw out tradition. And oh, that's so obnoxious. Is that? Sorry, I should have shut that off. Um, he throws out, and he, th and he throws out tradition. But who does he leave standing? He's not leaving us in an uncertain world. You are going to be the key to certainty. So now let's journey a little bit forward. We got a very cocky 18th century. They love these epistemologies, these modern epistemologies that put, put reason in charge and trust to science and philosophy. And yet we've got those romantics, and they say, OK. Reason's all right, rationality's good, definitely don't trust tradition, definitely uh, don't trust traditional theology. Be rebellious, be self-motivated and self-directed, but hold on, there's a whole lot more going on between your ears than merely reason and rationality. There is, a, maybe you could call it an abyss, or you could call it an infinite well of wisdom between your ears. We don't know where the mind begins. 
and where it ends. We don't know what consciousness is. So already, as we've evolved into these modern people, we've been told that we are, in a way, responsible for truth in our own lives. Reason is part of it. Science is part of it. But the romantics also let us know that there's a subjective quality that supersedes reason and science and experimentation. And now, quantum consciousness has taken that subjectivity even farther. It's gone from this rational subject to this rational reasoner to this rational reasoner who's also a romantic, expansive consciousness to quantum consciousness, this expansive subject who participates in the structuring of reality. OK, we're getting it. The self is going to be, in a way, the sort of harbor, the natural harbor of magical thinking, where magical, magical thinking used to reside in, say, the early modern period or even before then. It might reside in religion. It might reside in a priest. It might reside in a hermetic philosophy. Now, in a way, magic is going to reside in your subjectivity. It's not content so much. Magical beliefs are not philosophical anymore the way they used to be more of sort of philosophical system the way we had with the Hermeticists. Magic now is an understanding of what the capacities of your mind actually are. I've had this slide up here and we're talking about all these things converging together. So I had to talk about individualism and magic and now, one of the ways we see these things coming together, science, magic, and religion, in a strange way, even though I've talked about these things being in separate spheres, religion and science are institutional and public in a large way, and magic is solely relegated to the private sphere, for example, you have a chemistry um, department in UCLA. You don't have an alchemy department in UCLA, right? If you want to pursue magic, you have to do so on your own time in the private sphere as a form of entertainment. But at the same time, these three things come together. They separate, and yet they come together and overlap in strange ways. And one of the things that is totally noticeable about modernity and the new age and the way people experience religion in the 20th and 21st century is, a, is how much a role Eastern mysticism plays. And this is tied in many ways to Western individualism. It's tied to those features of our cultural identity that I've been talking about today, the romanticism, the emphasis on subjectivity, the emphasis of being your own religious guide that we got from Protestantism. And let's take just a brief look at what these religions are and what they're about, and maybe they'll make more sense. Well, in the big picture, if we're going to say the most obvious thing is that Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism all have a sort of interpretation of the cosmos that very loosely offers a metaphor consistent with the sort of quantum interpretation of the universe. The notion that mind has a structuring role in the universe is very much captured in the Hindu notion of maya, right? The idea that all of this material universe that we're living in is merely a sort of collective illusion that we are imprisoned in. The notion that psychologically you are driven through the caste system according to your own spiritual desires. So it is literally the quality of your thinking and what you desire according to my very loose interpretation of, of um, a Hindu karmic drives. If you desire very earthbound things, very sensual sensory things, then that quality of consciousness is going to incarnate in a life that is very sensorily driven. You're going to be at the basis level of the karmic scale because matter is inferior, sensory drives are inferior to moral, ethical, 
and religious drives. And conversely, if your psychic disposition is so refined and exquisite that all you want to do is commune with God, then you're going to be born as a Brahmin. And this sort of tends to work itself out evolutionarily because after a few lives, you get sick and tired of only craving physical things. And then you move on to want more substantive things, which is the next level, which are the people that, um, that crave to be involved in larger projects, like the business people and the merchants. Then beyond them, once they get tired of owning shops and getting rich and money, which is really sensory desire expanded to a sort of social level, they start having nobler ideas. They start thinking, well, you know, I really want to be a leader and help people and shape society. Then they become the warriors, et cetera, and the princes. And then the last and final caste, the Brahmanical caste, is the priests. But you see, this is very psychological. So that's going to really appeal to the West, the role of the individual in creating his own life, and this notion that the mind interacts with one's conscious experience, that with mind, in a way, manifests one's material reality. Now, how do we interpret and practice Hinduism in America? Quite frankly, uh, you know, people are not really practicing Hinduism in a sacrificial, Brahmanical way, right? People are not building giant bonfires and sacrificing animals and dressing up as priests. They've stripped out almost all of the social regulatory functions of these religions were very complex. They were involved in um, ordering society, creating ethics for the entire sort of social dynamics of people's interaction. We didn't need that in the West. We stripped all of that out. We kept the Upanishads and the yoga program, right? <laughs> Because that's how we're going to just work on our individual souls and our individual progress. So we really shouldn't confuse what we're doing with Hinduism, uh, actual Hinduism. But what is interesting is how much um, that idea of that the, the Eastern perspective on material reality is much more subjective. In the Bible, in Christian theology, it is clear that God created the world. God created the world. You don't tell God that, oh, God, nice illusion, nice trick photography. You don't tell that to God, right? God created the world. The physical world is real, and it matters, right? It's the framework in which the Jews were originally supposed to carry out their covenant with God. There's a kind of primacy on material, physical reality that's just sort of ingrained there in, uh, in Genesis and the Old Testament that isn't there in Hinduism. Now let's look at some of the sort of social and psychological factors that also lend Eastern mysticism to um, new kinds of Western spirituality. The other really huge one other than uh, we've got Buddhism in, uh, in addition to Hinduism is Buddhism. But what is Buddhism? Buddha was a rebellious Hindu. Buddha was a Hindu who took a look at all of this, you know, these uh, social conventions and this oppressive caste system, and he thought, this is just ridiculous, um, pretentious lies, and I'm going to try to find out what is the truth of what is the truth of existence, really. And so in a way, Buddha's rejection of all the social constraints of Hinduism embodies a kind of individualistic spirit willing to reject convention, convention willingness to reject the world. And anybody who's practiced Buddhism, you know, part of it is really an almost empirical, practical, some even call it scientific program. How do you achieve enlightenment? Well, Buddha goes off and he studies how to achieve enlightenment through trial and error, trial and error, trial and error, like a good scientist. He comes back and says, boom, eightfold path. I can't tell you. I'm not going to over-explain anything, because I'm a, uh, like a good scientist. He's only going to tell you what he knows. He's not going to speculate. Like Newton, he doesn't feign hypotheses. So all we know is that nirvana is the extinction of that desiring id, that little uh, clamoring self that wants to manifest in the world, that's attached to things and keeps you ground in this universe, 
you can shut that guy up and by quieting his energy and his desires, and then all of this material illusion, which is brought into existence by those desires, will fade away. Extinction, nirvana, uh, lights out. Does that mean there's nothing left? Who knows? He doesn't say. Or perhaps there's something wonderful. But that's the whole practice. Taoism, as well, uh, has this sort of spirit of rebelliousness, the role of the individual in determining what's right for me. Just the way Buddha said, I'm not going to be told what to do by those Hindu priests. What's right for me? I'm going to start a spiritual journey that is very driven by individual, the individual. Um, Taoism shares some of these qualities. And, and then even more, it's also influenced to a, a degree. Zen Buddhism is influenced to a degree by Taoism. And Zen Buddhism is where we get these koans like, if a tree falls in the woods, can you hear it? What is the sound of one hand clapping? There's not just this um, sort of irreverent disregard for convention. There's also a, a almost appreciation for the fact that reality is an illusion, and we are trapped in this illusion. That's very Hindu. That's very Buddhist. Uh, reality is an illusion. In order to break the illusion, break the mask, we have to disrupt this like cone of reason, this horrible helmet head that we have on our bodies, where our senses and our rationality force us to interpret this as real. So part of Taoist practice in these koans is to force you to sort of smack the brain, get it disoriented, and force it to think in an irrational way. Because outside of reason is a higher form of consciousness. Why do people love this stuff? Because we are romantics, right? Westerners just love this, how rebellious it is. We are also people that are trying to wrestle with these ideas of quantum consciousness. And, and we're, so we're also trained to be, as we try to search for truth, we're trained to be scientific. And in a way, Taoism combine so many of these elements, right? You get the rejection of Confucianism, where Confucius was the guy saying, respect your parents. You should you know, put your mat over in that corner when you're talking to your sister. And you should put your mat over in that corner when you're talking to your aunt, that all social relationships were going to be extremely regulated according to this Taoist, this, uh, the Tao, the way, the harmony, the perfect coordination and orchestration of energy totally socially controlling in a way. Everything was about ritual and formula. Then you get um, Lao Tzu come in and go, forget it. This is such a drag. I'm just going to get on my pony and ride away with his water buffalo. And I'm just going to be me. I'm just going to go into nature. And I'm just going to commune with nature and the brook and experience the Tao. So in these religions, uh, in these Eastern religions, you get this convergence of Western individualism, a, a new kind of Western appreciation for the quantum mysteries of mind, and the sort of the rebellious spirit in which Buddhism, Taoism, and the Upanishads were all conceived in a way as a rejection of materialism, ritualism, and convention. In a way, all of those come from the romantic impulses of each of those societies. Therefore, it is no wonder that it's our romantic impulse that gloms onto them. Now let's go to this idea of self-help and spirituality. Well, we've already talked about how incredibly powerful the notion of the self is and how that self has been fueled over various phases in our intellectual development since the 1600s. And this has sort of exploded into this notion of self-help. Well, doesn't it make sense that if you are this really important actor, you actually are not just a subject in the world. You're an object that you can create. So you're not necessarily a victim of social determination and uh, you know, who your parents were, that you have the notion to invent and transform yourself through certain disciplines. It's semi-scientific in its own way, right? It tries to treat you as a project that needs to be worked on, that can be fixed. 
Um, so there's something very Western and progressive and individualistic about it. It's evolutionary in a way. You're evolving yourself towards a greater perfection. And this has just totally exploded in our culture. It starts off really with, a, remember, Norm Vincent Peale's The Power of Positive Thinking. Now, he wasn't necessarily saying something about quantum consciousness. He was just saying, you know, if you think positively and behave in a way that expects positive outcomes, that actually shapes optimistic behaviors that end up being really effective in reality. So you should do it. You should think positively. And um, you get this idea comes out in people like, um, remember Tony Robbins? He's not big anymore, is he? Tony Robbins, he's really scary. He gets on that stage, starts waving his arms and yelling at you. Um, well, if Tony's, it's like, say you were at, we go to this self-help convention in, uh, it's downtown in one of those giant convention centers. You go to the self-help convention, and this is what someone like Tony Robbins will have to, to, to tell you in the tradition of self-help in the non-mystical way. He'll yell at you and say, you know what? It's your fault that you're not more successful. And don't you want to be like me on my jet? And if you do, you've got to think about being responsible for your own life. And what are the 10 things that you hate doing, that you're afraid to do, that you won't do? Write those things down. And then you go out there, and you do those 10 things. And then tomorrow, your life will be better. And you might be in that convention hall, and you might be thinking, you know, Tony, there's a reason I don't do those 10 things. Did you recall the part where I hate them, and I'm afraid to do them? So, so you would leave that room, and you would go to a much more seductive and interesting speaker. Somebody who's talking about um, the works of Shakti Gawain. And she has this, uh, his uh, famous book, Creative Visualization. And this is Hindu idealism, right? That notion that the world is just an illusion. Well, then why not make it a really massive hallucination that you yourself are driving. If it's just an illusion, it might as well be one that is personally beneficial to you. So you go into the Shakti Gawain um, seminar, and here you're told something much more pleasant. You don't have to actually do all those things that Tony Robbins is telling you that you have to do in your little uh, program book. All you have to do is go into your room, close the shades, and start visualizing these things happening. And they will magically start to happen in your life. I don't know about you, but one of these programs seems a whole lot more appealing um, than the other. And so, so much of the self-help movement has actually been infiltrated by the sort of Eastern uh, mysticism and idealism. But whereas Eastern mysticism and idealism within the religious framework was with Buddha, it's about getting out of here. It's about transcending matter. It's about getting out of this illusion of materialism. In the hands of the Western self-help movement, Eastern idealism becomes a way about getting the material world to take the material form you want the material world to take. So it's almost like Western individualism and Western materialism have converged and made such a potent and seductive cocktail, we cannot help ourselves but drink this. We are not going to get over magical thinking because magical thinking feels good, right? If you can't pay your traffic ticket and you just, what would you rather do? Have to go out and get a job and you know, you work nights to pay your traffic ticket? Or would you rather go into your room and think about your traffic ticket getting magically paid? So most people you know, are going to do the latter. And just as an example of how this is so infiltrated the mainstream, Wayne Dyer, who usually starts, he starts his power of intention lecture talking about quantum physics, not in a very considered way. But he'll just throw a couple of things out about you know, the participation of the mind in creating the universe. And he'll talk about waves and particles and bedazzle people. And then he'll launch into his, his lecture. And the power of intention here is, a kind of combination of intention like Tony Robbins and intention like Shakti Gawain, yeah, you have to have a physical program you're acting out in the world, but the real energy is coming from you driving the world through your mental visualization, through your focus of your intention and desire. So intention becomes a way of actually collapsing the particle, making the world take a form you want. And I want you to notice what we've got here in self-help. 
We've almost got, gone from, and this is so perfect for Western modernity and Western individualism. Instead of God being this guy that you have to worship and praise and like interrupt your Sunday and then maybe do some charity work, and he gets to have all the magic, you've got this other smorgasbord, this cornucopia of delight, where you can become uh, God. God can become your like sort of personal coach. God is like you're just trying to tap into uh, this creative consciousness of God. So God is like a giant vending machine, just giving you you know what you want. So in a way, remember magic. If we're just to define it, it's using supernatural, manipulating supernatural energy to direct outcomes in this world. And remember that thing we were talking about happens um, in Christi Christianity, particularly in the early modern period, but it's just part of Christianity. Christianity is not supposed to be magical. You're not supposed to manipulate God, manipulate the supernatural forces, and get what you want. You're not supposed to do that. It's not magical. And yet, look how magic thrives and persists. With uh, Where is it? It's not in religion. It's in the private sphere of self-help. And in a way, it assumes many of the features of religion. But you're getting it in bookstores, in your yoga classes, on Oprah, The Secret. I mean, that's just sort of, this just is a summary of everything I've been saying. The essence of the secret is, for all, for what, what, how does that thing start? There's a secret. They've been trying to keep it from you. The, the powerful people of the world have always known that the seek laws of attraction, like attracts like. There's no moral aspect to the secret. It's just like attracts like. So if you think riches, riches will come to you. So this is a sort of magical thinking. There's magical correspondences. Dark thoughts attract dark thoughts. It's, it's alchemical in a way, because uh, it's looking for these hidden correlations. And this woman has made, I don't even know if we can confine it to the millions. I mean, she is just bankrolling the magical future that she, it's not just in her head now. It's going to be in her reality and her yacht and everything else she's going to have. But, um, you know, it was so funny, like one of the ads for uh, the secret that I saw on like late night TV infomercial, it's so vulgarly materialistic. It's just like the perfect religion for the consumer uh, American. There, this woman is thinking, she's looking in the mirror and she doesn't have any jewelry on and she's really, really sad. She's spiritually crushed that she doesn't have any jewelry. <laughs> and, and then she reads the secret, she orders the secret, she reads the secret and then she goes out and she's looking in a shop window and there's the exact ugly tacky necklace she was dreaming of wearing and suddenly it's on the other side of the glass, it's on her neck and she didn't actually have to punch a hole through the glass and steal it, it just sort of magically appeared. I think maybe they had a sale or the owner came running out to give it to her, who knows? But she got the necklace and this is brings me to sort of my last point I wanted to make in association with this issue of magic in the private sphere. Your individuality was first sort of conceived and articulated as a form of political agency. Remember when we were reading um, about the French Revolution and we had the um, Abbe de Sies and uh, what, what makes the nation and he's talking about this revolutionary idea that who is the nation? The people are the nation. You got to think, in a medieval mindset, you did not matter. You had no political consciousness. You were not a political actor. If you wanted to be a political actor, only people that can wage war and raise money, those are political actors. And until you start getting people participating in war and making money and paying taxes, until you get the peasantry really learning how to fight and getting involved in sort of economic structures that create a middle class, these people are totally left out. Most of the people are left out, and we have this very thin, thin elite doing everything, and you don't matter. We get to the French Revolution largely driven by these economic transformations that made more people matter more and more powerful. But the idea was, so beautifully put in the French Revolution, it was interpreted that the, this individual and how we were going to reward and honor this individual 
was through political representation. That the sort of crowning prize or jewel of your individuality is this political identity of citizen. Now, fast forward to the 21st century. 36% of Americans, I think, voted in, um, I shouldn't say that, Californians. So it was like a really pathetically low turnout, probably even worse than that, um, in the most recent election. Basically, we don't vote. Like, we just do not vote at all. I mean, we, there was a, considered to be a huge Obama turnout. It was you know, barely over uh, 50%. So it's just not where we really feel that, more, that powerful. In fact, if you ask people, they go, I don't really vote because it doesn't seem to impact much. Nothing I, you know, these politicians really don't implement anything I care about. But where are we really, really, really powerful? Where do you just rule your life? as a consumer, right? I mean, modernity knew we were going to make the individual powerful. Maybe these philosophers thought we were going to do it in the realm of science and we were going to make the individual powerful in the realm of politics. Nobody could have guessed that we are all kings and queens in the realm of our own consumer habits. Um, you can buy anything you want as long as you've got the money. You can wear anything you want. If you want to buy healing crystals and gems, that's fine. If you want to go on a mystical retreat and be inserted in the you know, clays of uh, uh, Titicaca, go ahead. All right. Now, remember, the FDA is going to bust you if you make scientific claims that are not substantiated. The FDA does try to regulate this. But if you, as a consumer, say, I'm just being entertained, I'm sure if I were to look at this book or this video, I think they probably have to have a disclaimer on there somewhere about this is just entertainment. Entertainment is the realm of the private sphere. You have a right to be entertained any way you want. And as long as you got the money, you can create um, a marketplace that is not just about things, but about ideas. You can create the religious beliefs you want in this marketplace of ideas as a consumer of new intellectual products and I'm not even making fun of it necessarily because this is very empowering. I mean, this is a, an extraordinary amount of personal freedom. And you know, maybe what people do with this freedom isn't always inspiring. But at the same time, there is something very, very um, empowering about how unregulated the, uh, the c consumer realm is. Um, and also, in a way, America makes this just even America makes this even worse because where are you ever, ever such a tyrant as you are in your relations with customer service? I mean, please, right? I mean, do you know when the police pull you over, it's no, sir, yes, ma'am, right? And with, uh, with most authority figures in your life, but God help the poor customer service agent. And this notion that I ordered the green vase, not the blue vase, and that, you know, now the world, my, um, you know, I just see my friends having these meltdowns over the direction of the, uh, the, the grain of their cabinetry. And um, in some ways, this is because we have come to expect total potency, the total fulfillment of our desires. If I ordered my kitchen cabinet this way, it better come this way. In a way, as a consumer, is the place where we have the most bloated expectations of the fulfillment of our wishes. So it's an interesting, an interesting sphere. Um, I already assigned you some Carlos Castaneda because he is the new age guru par excellence. What was so interesting is that it took them five years to actually start thinking that maybe these books were fiction and not reality. Because do you think the publisher who was just selling uh, copies like hotcakes, he didn't want to pull the plug. And Castaneda was an anthropologist from a very respectable university, so it looked like it had scientific cr credibility. But what is so interesting about sort of Castaneda's ideas are how they bring together this quantum mechanics, consumer expectations. They bring together the sense of we control our own reality and can manifest what are the source of all our desires. Okay, so I have this, this quote here. 
The, all, the old sorcerers believed that since it is our life experience, this force is, after all, it is a supreme importance that it can be satisfied with facsimile ugh, of our life experience. The recapitulation. Having had what it seeks, the dissolving force then lets sorcerers go, free to ex expand their capacity to perceive and reach with it the confines of time and space. So Castaneda says he stumbled into the, uh, you know, goes into the desert. He meets up with a Yaqui Indian uh, named um, Don Juan, and that these are the teachings of Don Juan, who is an old sorcerer. But the notion clearly here is that there is not only a life force, but that in a way, um, according to Don Juan, life force lends itself to us. It's not like a, it's like a form of awareness. It's consciousness, it's intelligence, it's self-awareness. And what it is, is a seeker of more information, more knowledge. And what it does is, through human beings, is try to further elaborate experience and knowledge. And so sometimes this life force will try to harvest experience from you and you'll die. But if you're a yaki uh, sorcerer, you know how to be eternal because you know how to just feed this force with the facsimile or the information. You know how to just give it your experience without giving it your life. So it's this very sort of strange and mystical understanding of life force as a kind of divine mind that, that can itself be tamed and manipulated and fed into your own ever-expanding consciousness. Now I have a few more um, aspects to, to discuss about magic. Magic we've talked about in the private sphere, right? Don Juan uh, Castaneda is not going to be taught in anthropology, right? You're not going it, to, if it's taught in anthropology, it's more likely going to be taught as cultural anthropology of the 20th century. Or it'll be taught in a literature class, but it is no longer ever going to be considered part of the official institutional doctrines of science. However, you would be surprised how much the official institutions of science have actually been bitten by, by, the, magic, by the magic bug. Now, would it surprise you to know that our government, well, nothing should surprise you about our government, so, um, but that they had some American tax dollars lying around, and they found out in 1972, oh my god, the Russians are not only spying, they have a paranormal program where they're trying to find out if they can use telepathy to spy on us. Um, and so we actually funded a program that investigated telepathy as a possible source of, of, of spying. Now, in order to get money from the Congress, they had to have some semblance of a kind of scientific rationale, and they got it. The Stanford Research Institute in Palo Alto was given a grant by the CIA to investigate uh, telepathy, and the findings were conclusive enough that they're actually able to take this to the Congress and get funding for it, which led to the development of the Stargate program, which was a remote viewing program with the CIA. Um, David Morehouse was one of these Stargaters, and he described remote viewing like this. Remote viewer sits alone or with a monitor and enters an altered state of consciousness. Remember that altered state of consciousness that the romantics probed? I mean, this is supposed to be the site where anything can happen. In this condition, the viewer copies a set of randomly assigned numbers, the coordinates, that represent the concept of the target in the mind of the collective unconscious. Then, using the protocols of the process, the viewer begins detecting and decoding relevant visual and verbal sensory data, blah, blah, blah. So this is what this guy was doing. They would, he would be in a room by himself, then the CIA people, and they would sit him in the dark and have him meditate, go into a meditative trance. Then the CIA people would come in with coordinates describing the target, meaning if they wanted to look at a Russian defense cell, they wouldn't tell him what it was, but they would probably just take regular Cartesian um, uh, coordinates that we'd use on a map and give them to him, making sure he, uh, but they would randomize them so he wouldn't recognize them. And then, he would 
actually start to visualize and describe these Russian defense installations. And according to him, I don't know how this works, but he was able to describe the Russian defense installations, which were then later confirmed um, via satellite. So it's just like, OK, um, you know, what, what can I say to that? However, our government, when they found out about how crazy this program had become, they actually pulled the plug on it. So this program no longer exists. But the people in the program actually say that uh, not only were the Americans doing this, and not only were they making uh, progress, but the Russians were doing it, the Czechs were doing it, the Germans, even the British had a paranormal program, that there's this whole sort of secret world of psychic investigation of possibility that's taking place. Um, all right, another thing, the, uh, sign the scientific institutions sort of sashing over to magic and flirting with magical possibilities, animal telepathy. This is Rupert Sheldrake. He is a biologist. You know, he's a fairly respectable scientist. But what he investigates are totally sort of non-respectable things, like animal telepathy. And one of his experiments investigated this parrot called Nikizi, and that's his owner, Amy. Now, Amy reported that she'd just be thinking stuff in her head, and then suddenly Nikizi would be over there, and he would start babbling what was going on in her head as if he was reading her mind. Now, Nikizi had a vocabulary of maybe 300 words, so he couldn't say everything that was in her mind, but she was convinced he was reading her mind. Rupert Sheldrake goes in there, and he sets up the following double-blind experiment. He puts Nikizi in one room with monitors, and he puts uh, Amy in another room with monitors. And so the people that are watching Amy and the people that are watching Nikizi Neither of them know what's happening in the other room. It's double blind. Both are ignorant about the other party. Then they had 300 cards made up, each with a symbol of a word that Nikizi knows. They would show it to Amy so that she would be, if Nikizi knows the word tree or the no, knows the word lemon or whatever, showing that card to Amy, she would start thinking tree, 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 lemon, 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 tree, tree, tree. And then over here, Nikizi would start suddenly squawking tree, lemon, tree. So that, and they didn't know anything about the, whether the, when the cards were being shown, what cards were being shown, perfectly double blind study. And apparently this was significant, way more than um, st statistically powerful corollaries that indicated this parrot was actually reading her mind. <laughs> Martin! <laughs> out! Right now! Come on, that situation was out of control. They did another really fun double-blind study. Go to your spot. They did another really fun double-blind study uh, with, Rupert Shel with Rupert Sheldrake, where he had masters who had dogs that they said, this dog always knows when I'm coming home. And he took them, and he would have them go out shopping and do their errands. And he set up a camera. They set up a camera out. They set up a camera in their homes to watch the dogs. Then they would call the owners. So the owners have no idea when they're going to be called to go home. And the dog obviously doesn't know when they're going to be called to go home. And they would put uh, the cameras on the dog so they could record the dog's response. And again, in a statistically significant manner, when the dogs, when the owners were called and said, come on home, as their intentions shifted towards home, the dogs got all excited, and the closer the owners got to home, the more intentional they became about going home, the stronger that response was. And Sheldrake offered this interpretation of morphic resonance. You know how we're both an electron and we're, a, we're, we're both a particle and a wave, and all those waves have interference patterns, and so constantly, uh, our, and also our, our particles get entangled with each other. He proposed that there's a sort of morphic field of resonance that two bodies, two or organisms that live together and know a lot about each other, their morphic fields 
these little sort of wave packets that contain their bodies, the particles that can constitute their bodies, are entangled and interfering. And therefore, they both have a sense of each other because they disturb each other's fields as they move through the world. The way those two electrons, once they were joined, had a sense of each other and had some kind of non-local relationship, he's trying to suggest using physics, non-locality and entanglement ways of describing this. And then this is my last and a favorite, although we'll have to do the Jesus toast tomorrow. Um, I know, Jesus toast is good. Um, doctor, this was on that movie. How many of you guys saw that movie, What the Bleep? What the Bleep? OK, What the Bleep was that movie about consciousness. And uh, it was really a movie about quantum consciousness. It was a huge hit. It was in some mainstream theaters. And one of the pieces of scientific evidence they gave for the impact of consciousness on reality, on physical forms, was submitted by Dr. Masaru Emoto, who said, I have conducted an experiment where I've had my lab technicians take three different beakers of water. One beaker, we will call it the test beaker, the control beaker, nothing was done. Untreated distilled water. The second beaker, I wrote love and appreciation on the beaker, and I had my lab techs focus love and appreciation on the beaker. Another beaker, I pasted with, you make me sick, I will kill you. And I carried out this rigorous study, and I had my lab technicians think hateful thoughts about the water in that beaker. Then I had my lab technicians analyze the beaker's contents. Untreated distilled water, OK. Not so, not so bad, not so great. There's a certain amount of new, neutral order in that water molecule. Look at love and appreciation. It's crystalline. What does that mean? A crystal is the most highly structured molecular pattern you can get. It's like order in overdrive, right? That means the information is coordinated. God, it's act together. The vibe is so good that everything is totally copacetic to be a crystal. I hate you. You make me sick. Look what happened. The chaos in that molecule. It totally broke down. It wasn't able to exist as an ordered system anymore. It's just completely decomposing. Oh my god, I can't believe it. It's real. It's true. They've finally proven it. Um, here's the problem. Dr. Masaru Emoto actually had his technicians search around in the beakers for the molecules they wanted. You see you leave that little bit out of your, of your study, that little fact out. He also got his doctorate at a correspondence school. I wish I had known about that. So, um, so Dr. Masaru Emoto was yet presented on, in this film, What the Bleep Are We Talking About, without any of these qualifications about his scientific credentials or the kind of veracity of his investigation. And the other scientists talking on the show never discussed it. So, you know, you have to just go with a critical eye is all I'm asking. All right. Um, I guess I will see you on Thursday.